Hello everyone, welcome to church. My name is Daniel. I'm a friend of Shelter Rocks and I'll be reading the scripture with you today. The scripture today will be from the book of Exodus, chapter 19, from verse 7 to 25. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words of the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord and many of them perish. Even the priests who approached the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us. Put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. This is the word of the Lord. Good afternoon, morning, evening, whenever you're watching. My name is JC and I'm so grateful to be here with you guys. I'm one of the pastors on staff. Just wanna say thank you to Daniel for reading that passage for us. It was a pretty lengthy one to go through. But I'm glad to be here with you today and I'm really excited to jump into this incredible part of the story in Exodus. If you haven't seen the pattern yet, it's probably more than any other book in the Bible, this, this, this pattern of power, these mighty acts of God. And these mighty acts of God are, are, are sung about all over the Psalms. There are songs and poems, exaltations, meant for the people of God to declare out loud corporately. Read Psalm 77 and 78 and 80 and 81, 135, 114, 136. There are many to list. Let me read one. Psalm 135. I know that the Lord is great, that our Lord is greater than all gods. The Lord does whatever pleases him in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and all their depths. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. He struck down the firstborn of Egypt, the firstborn of people and animals. He sent his signs and wonders into your midst, Egypt, 
against Pharaoh and all of his servants. See, what we're able, what we're able to take out from this is this recognition that our God is a great God. He is a mighty God. He is a powerful God, a very present help in our time of trouble. God is reliable and he is trustworthy. The passage we just read in Exodus chapter 19 describes this event where God is about to reveal himself, that is his presence to all of Israel. It is the only time in the Old Testament where the entire community of Israel is gathered to have this direct experience of God, to hear him without an intermediary. No one between them to talk, but God himself talked directly with them. And the primary purpose of this theophany, revelation of God, we learn in verse 9. I'm going to come to you, he says, in a dense cloud, so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. He's talking to Moses. It's about giving them a new trust. Not just to follow a pillar of cloud or fire at night, it's, it's to trust the mediator that he has sent. In this case, it's Moses. Now, up until this point, Israel has seen every visible manifestation of God's power, whether, whether it was the plagues or the parting of the Red Sea or manna, quail, and the battle they just had. God is now inviting them into this very personal encounter with his presence. It's not just a demonstration of his power, but it's the revelation of his presence. It's an intimate opportunity that they're getting to hear his very voice. Now, I just want to share this quick personal story about my own life. When I was 19, I came to know God. It was a personal experience that I had at one of our services in youth. And and, and I began to pursue him in the word and in prayer. And one particular night, I remember being in my room and I was praying and I felt like God was inviting me to read scripture and sing songs. And he's telling me which songs to sing. And I remember at this one point, I was getting ready to go. In those days, we had beepers on our side. I had it on my clip and we were going to go hang out with some friends. And I'm waiting for them to reach out to me to go hang out that night. And as I'm there praying, I just, I, I, I couldn't help but like, man, I don't want to leave this time. And I remember this. I, I got up because I got the beep, hey, come pick us up. I was the only guy with cars. You guys know this back in the day. If you're the one with the cars, you're the one that picks everybody up. And so I got the beep. I walk out into the hallway. And as I'm getting ready to close my door and walk down a hallway, I could hear the voice of God speaking to me. Whether it was externally, inside of me, I, I, I don't know how it, it, you know, that, that moment felt like, but I'll, here's what I do remember. I remember a very specific invitation of God, him saying, could you spend some more time with me? I couldn't say no. I threw my beeper across the floor of the hallway, went back into my room, closed the door, and I, there I stood in my room over the word of God in prayer and singing songs and weeping deeply for hours. I didn't care about being with my friends. Now, I'm not sure where some of you may stand on that theologically, but for me, it was an experience to hear his voice and I know God speaks to us in many different ways through people and in moments and in the word. But this encounter with God has been an anchor for my faith in him. And this encounter is going to be an anchor for the Israelites. That after this moment, they will falter and fail as I have done over and again, but they will never be unconvinced of his presence. Now, before I highlight some of the parts that I see in this passage, I'd like to make a contextual observation. You know, last week we read through verses 1 through 6, and we see that God is continuing to lead them, right? At this point, they're in a desert. It's been three months since they've left Egypt, and they've come to this location in the desert of Sinai. If you're looking at a map, uh, we can see that where they leave Egypt, it's from the west, they're traveling southeast towards Sinai. And instead, they so sh should be going northeast. And that's where the promised land is. It's waiting for them. They're now in a place that is further away from where they had hoped to be. And it's further away from where they had started. It was definitely far worse. Now, I'm not sure if anybody here can relate with that. You come to this place where you trust God. And somehow, it seems like you are further away from, than where you were when you started before you met him. 
You thought you should be further. You thought, you thought it should be happier. You thought you should be in this place. And God's not doing what you want him to do. And these people, I mean, up to this point, we've been reading this. They do nothing but complain. They believe that they were better off in Egypt where the food was better. I mean, never mind the fact that they were slaves back in the day. It's all about perspective sometimes for us. I love this uh, the thought that came uh, to a conversation we're having with Pastor um, Nathan. It seems like our current pain has a way to overshadow sometimes older, worse pain. Why is God leading them in this way? I want to submit this, that I think it has to do with trust. As humans, we have the tendency to trust only in what we think that we can control. And as a case study, I want to maybe present to you guys this case study in uh, Genesis chapter 37. We see the story of Joseph. Joseph, we read, is one of the youngest sons of Jacob, the son of his favorite wife, Rachel. Now, all of the other sons, they knew this about him, and they resented Joseph for it. And it wasn't like Joseph was innocent. He's not just this bystander. That This type of attention he gets from his father, it can get to one's head. And Joseph, in actuality, was very arrogant. He, in fact, he was also a snitch. We won't go in there. This is not today's message. But after God gives him a dream, he shows up to his family. His dad included is there. And he says, God showed me that all of you are going to bow down to me. Now, this made his brothers furious, more angry, more jealous. It even infuriated his father. It would get me mad if my brother did that. Now, if you know anything about the story, uh, Joseph is sold off into slavery. He is accused of sexual misconduct. He is placed in jail. He is forgotten. He's alone. He's left to wallow in his hurt and in his despair. He is confused. Does this feel like anyone's story today? During this time, he is broken down and stripped of all of his pride, that all the stuff that he's used to. God later uses him after he is saved and he's confronting his family, a changed man. Now, one could say, why didn't God from the beginning just tell Joseph, hey, Joseph, you're kind of a jerk. He could have saved all of this trouble, redeemed him from slavery. You didn't have to do that. But let me just ask you a question. Ask your parents if just telling you to do something was enough to change you. Those of you guys with teenagers, how, does, how is it like when you just tell your kids to change? Do they change right away? Now, I'm not even going to ask some of you guys who are married. Don't ask your spouse. It's going to be a bad day. Now, in God's grace, he will often lead us away from where we, we think we need to be into a place where he needs us to be. A place where we run to the end of ourselves, a depleted of trust in our ability and looking towards heaven with nothing left but to trust in the creator of heaven and on earth. John Newton puts it this way, God's mysterious, about God's mysterious ways, everything is needful that he sends and nothing is needful that he withholds. Here in this desert of Sinai, God is going to prepare his people for an encounter. He's about to reveal himself as the one and only God and establish their trust in Moses as God's only mediator. Ultimately, God is preparing his people, uh, kind of establishing the terms of their relationship because in the next few weeks, we're going to be going into the Ten Commandments. So I want to dive into this passage, and we're going to have to do this pretty quickly with the time we have left. So first, encountering a holy God. We see this in verse 10. God, uh, he tells the people, go to the people. He tells Moses, go to the people and consecrate them. Now, Moses is instructed to ensure that the people are consecrated in preparation to meet him. It's sort of a throwback. If you remember, Moses' first encounter with God on a mountain, it's actually this very mountain. God shows up in a burning bush, and there at the bush, he tells Moses what? Do you remember? To remove your sandals because the place you're on is holy ground. He's consecrating himself. Here, he's asking them to consecrate themselves, to separate themselves, set themselves apart for three days. You know, we come across this idea in this kind of this moment here of holiness. Holiness is a complex idea. We don't have time to go into it, but it includes like this external and internal component. There's a personal kind of moral conduct of our individual, how we behave, but there's also this internal reality of heart that has to change. So God is asking them in this moment, right, because the Holy Spirit's not there, to, to wash their clothes, to ab abstain from sexual relationships. And we're not going to get into that part here. But it's an act of foregoing the things that we desire, like fasting. It's a ritual act. It's about their external life. 
It's an image of setting ourselves apart to be holy as we encounter a very holy God, one who himself is set apart different than any other God. These instructions, they continue to verse 15, and they include the boundaries all over the mountain. They can't pass them. Now, it's meant for the people to kind of keep them away from getting too close. And on the one hand, I, I, here's what I have to admit. It feels very strange that God would call his people to come close, but then say, if they get too close, stone them and shoot them with arrows. But the reality is, it's for their own good. It's their protection. You know, they were at their best behavior for three days, but their heart, their impure hearts, their unholy lifestyles would just be consumed. They would be killed to encounter God. But what sticks out to me in this passage is this. God, in his desire, is drawing them close to be with him. His creation, come to the mountain, come be as close as you can. He is inviting them, and then he prepares them himself so that he can encounter, so they can encounter him. The second thing we see in this, uh, God prepares to meet his people. In verse 16 and 18, we're brought into this terrifying scene. Thunder, lightning, thick clouds, billowing smoke, and the trembling mountain. It's an image of a great and mighty God. This week, in a conversation with Pastor Nathan, he put it this way. He is not a God who can be tamed. And the reality is that we need a God like this. I don't know what situation that you've been going through in your life, but the reality is we don't need a tame God that does everything we want him to do as if he's beckoning to us. We need a God who is mighty. Whatever situation you're going through, that this God is bigger than and greater than that situation. That's the God that you need to come and have an experience with. Charles Spurgeon puts it this way. The sight of God upon the, upon the mountain must cause an awe in the soul that is not easily described. Oh, to be in the company with God, to be allowed to speak to him as a man speaketh with his friend, to be permitted to approach his glorious majesty without fear or trembling, this is no small privilege. This scene ends in verse 19 with the sound of a loud trumpet, a chauffeur. Moses spoke with God, with the, and the voice of God answered him. This is powerful. My third observation is this. God is calling his people to trust in this mediator. In verse 25, so Moses went down. Moses acts as a mediator between God and his people. He goes up, and then he comes down. And this will be his role for the next 40 years as he's leading the Israelites. God in this moment is affirming Moses with his very own voice, calling the people to trust in Moses, that he isn't crazy, but he hears from God. Of course, this, this small moment is actually a foreshadow. In, in Mark chapter 9, Jesus is walking with his disciples up a mountain. Eh? You see the correlation? He's up in a mountain. And in this, this moment, Elijah shows up. Moses shows up. A cloud covers them, just as a, a cloud descended on the mountain before talking to Moses. And if you want to follow, in uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 7, Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. In Exodus, God's people are invited to trust in and listen to Moses as the mediator. But in Christ, in the New Testament, we are invited to trust in and listen to the greater mediator, this greater Moses. And it is God himself who confirms his mediators. Jesus ultimately is confirmed in the miracles he performed, in the word that he taught. And finally, his resurrection proved that he is the son of God, the mediator of God. So I want to close with this thought with you guys here because this is just a powerful thing that's going on here. On the mountain, they could not approach the presence of God. It couldn't, could only come so far because of their sin. It separated them from God. But in Jesus, the greater mediator, we are invited all the way up into the mountain to be with God. This is amazing. Follow with me. Matthew chapter 27, 50 to 54. 
When Jesus had cried out, again in this loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. The centurion deduced correctly, surely this was the son of God. We can trust him. With all that we are, all the things that are happening in our lives, we're given this, this truth that we can approach, even in our sinful ways, we can approach the mountain of God. Tim Keller, in a message that he uh, shared on this very passage, he said this, and I'm just paraphrasing not word for word. He said, if we really knew how sinful we were, we would be full of fear of his judgment above all things. And yet, God invites us because of his mercy and grace. He invites us into his presence. Do you understand the extent to which Jesus has gone through to remove the boundary between you and him? You can enjoy his presence. You can confidently, the Bible tells us, approach the throne of grace. You don't have to have your head bowed down. You can come into his presence because he's removed that barrier. He's torn the curtain. We can walk through to be in the presence of God. And I want to invite you today as we pray, as we close out this time, to come all the way up into the presence of God. It's terrifying. It's mighty. It's great. We need a mighty God. But he also invites us lovingly into his presence to be under his protection. So can we pray today that you and me together, we might be able to approach as the body of Christ to the very presence of God, to trust him and the mediator that he has sent. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for this very special moment, for for the passage we read, this, this mighty and terrible, terrifying God that we would have fear of. And it's not fear that I want to run away from, though sometimes I do. It's this, this, this awe, this reverential awe that we get to have this God who is amazing. Sometimes we have the tendency to forget and we think that our relationship, the terms of our relationship are based on how I prepare myself and how good I am and the things that I do externally to make myself look right. But you know better. You know what's going on on the inside. And it's through Jesus, the great mediator, that you've come to wash us clean, not just our clothes externally, but our heart internally, to wash us, to make us pure for one very good purpose, that we might be in your presence, protected by you, hearing your voice, led by you, knowing that there's no greater place on earth to be, to be loved than in your presence. So thank you for that freedom. Thank you for this invitation. And thank you for your mediator. We trust you. We trust his words, Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen.